Hi there, I'm Michael Hill with Canine Chronicle TV, and today I'm here with Doug Johnson, and we're going to talk about who impacted you. So, Doug, tell us how you first got started in dogs, and who were the people who made those kind of impactful connections with you that made you who you are today? Well, sure. I, you know, I've been influenced by a lot of people, and you know, I think some of that's just through longevity in the sport. But without question, the first person who introduced me to the sport was Sandy Blakely. And she was a clumber spaniel breeder um, where I got my first dog. And um, we kind of had a great relationship and still do. Um, it's been uh, almost 40 years now. And wow. she, she sort of started me on that path. And you know, I was a young kid, I was uh, hungry for something. And this, she sort of, I think saw that in me and was mm -hmm. able to coach me and guide me and, and taught me a lot about showing. I mean, she taught me every, she laid the foundation for my kennel um, mm -hmm. in terms of, a, you know, ethical background and how to, how, what to look for, how to treat people, how to, you know, always kind of consider um, wanting more or wanting better out of the breed. Yeah. Um, how to, she was really focused on keeping the breed moving in a positive way and structure and soundness and strength of the breed. Um, and really, I've always sort of kept that in my mind that the breed should be strong, you know. And yeah. so when we first got involved in the breed, they weren't strong. And she had a wonderful dog who was sort of ahead of his time and as a sire even today sought after and still used so when you have when you create something that has you know decades worth of value or relevance to a breed you know you sort of look to that yeah and she really focused on um so many positive advancements in the breed we began checking hip scores i mean so when I got involved in my breed in the Columbus Spaniel, no one was even x-raying. And um, wow. there were, these dogs had OFA number six, you know. I mean, so we're, we're talking, you know, zero, one, two, three, four, you know, so <laughs> yeah. you're yeah. getting yeah. single digits. Uh, and so yeah. now we're up to over 700, almost 800 dogs that have ever, wow. yeah. So, you know, having someone to, instill in you at, a, at an early age that, you know, health and wellness is so important and um, expanding the longevity of a breed to keep them alive and healthier from, you know, from eight years to 10 years to 12 years or 14 years. And to watch yeah. a breed improve over that type of time is pretty amazing. So yeah. she, would, she would be that person that kind of coached me into um, keeping my brain focused that way. Um, and it sounds like a lot of those things you're touching on rely on kind of a vision for looking past what's right in front of you, like whether that's with seeing you young or seeing a breeding program in decades down the road, what's needed. Did you have that same vision going into your relationship with her and getting your first dog? Did you know you wanted to have a breeding program and a kennel or was it more um, immediate at that point? You know, it wasn't, I, um, I was 15, I couldn't even drive. So, you know, when I got the dog- She saw the raw talent. Yeah, and she did what I think we should all be doing, which is saying, hey, you know, instead of just taking this dog as your companion, would you consider showing it? And that's, that's what she that. said, you know, would you consider doing this? And we lived within 30 minutes of each other and I started to go to dog shows with her. So it was, it just sort of blossomed from there. And, you know, you get the dog show bug and you get that kind of fun uh, exchange with you and your dog in the competition and how much fun the people sure. are at dog shows. So it sort of, especially at, at 15, 16, it's exciting and interesting and unique to you. It was a world yeah. I didn't know anything about. And she opened that door for me. And then it makes it become like a passion where you're you're starting with just raw right. ability and interest and a love for a dog that then kind of becomes focused and directed on a bigger picture purpose. 
Yeah, I mean, you you end up striking a match that lights, you know, and all of a sudden there's a flame. Um, and wow. so I think that's what we're all looking for and to do, you know, in someone. You know, we're always, I, my one of the things I talk about today in, in, in my dog path is finding that person to replace yourself. And we're looking for people to carry on our vision, who understand our point of view and <clears throat> sort of share that point of view so that when you're retiring or deceased, that what you've done for so many years doesn't just vanish. The body of work continues just right. with different hands guiding it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But you're instilling in that next generation of breeder your yeah. philosophy you know, your point of view. Hmm. That's a, such a great point. Who else was impactful other than her? I think definitely Everett Dean, who was such a gentleman and a wonderful guy. And so interesting about that is Everett was the very first person I ever showed to. So the very really? first dog show I ever went to, I went, I actually went best to breed. I was there with Sandy with my mentor uh, who was yeah. coaching me on how to do everything. And we showed to Everett Dean um, and he was a local judge for us because uh, uh, we were living in Virginia at the time. And um, I mean, I didn't know anything of him and didn't certainly know anything of him after that, except mm -hmm. to experience showing to someone with such a positive ring manner and knowledge. I mean, he was such a, smart guy, wonderful gentleman. I mean, he was a Southern gentleman. And over the next five to 10 years, I would develop a friendship, mentoring friendship with him. And I always, when I was transitioning to judge, I would want to emulate someone like him, um, mm. very professional, um, yeah. Very, he was, he's very smart. He had a wonderful ring manner. Um, mm -hmm. And so I really kind of hope that I had some uh, ability to be more like Everett always. Uh, I, I yeah. really adored him. And he was very influential in sort of some self esteem building to remember that, you know, you have earned this position. Um, he was both uh, supportive as a breeder and as a judge for me um, in terms of, you know, you have to walk your own path. Um, so yeah. I certainly learned a lot of that from Everett. And I think that's a really interesting point about how judging dogs is not just about the technical aspect of understanding breeds and their purpose and their structure, but also it's such a ambassadorship to the public you know, with someone who at their first dog show, if they have a wonderful experience, it creates decades of a breeding program and success for other people. If their experience was less than positive, you know, when you're fragile and you're, you're not completely on board, that could really dissuade somebody from what could be a career in dogs sure. because it started off, you know, you know, knocked off at the beginning. Yes. You never know um, what's going on, you know, back at the setup or back at home with the yeah. people that are showing in front of you. And it's important to have an impactful and positive experience um, out mm -hmm. of your judge. Uh, and so, and yeah. as a judge, you, and Everett was very much that. He was always very positive. But the other thing that was so nice about him was his ability to speak freely about dogs mm -hmm. and um, have good recall uh, of, pedigree animals in your pedigree, you know, that he could relate to so that you can have a dialogue. And I think that's really important. It's one of the things that's sort of missing today, I think, in the sport is this cross um, generation exchange of knowledge. Um, so we didn't, we had, I was very fortunate when I first got started, that you had these big, powerful people in the sport of dogs that were really sort of guiding the sport. Or, you know, the, we always mentioned the biggies, you know, you've got um, Mrs. Clark, who was, you know, everything to everyone, and you had Janie, and you had Mike Billings, and, and certainly Everett would be in there as well, um, and Dorothy McDonald. I mean, those are people that all kind of formed a 
collective train of thought for me um, as a breeder and as a judge. You know, you want to sort of, um, you know, appreciate what you've been given by someone like that. Yeah. And I think it's cool to note too that that's multiple different people from different backgrounds who are kind of uniformly carrying a certain you know approach to dogs as breeders and judges. So it's giving it's giving some it's giving something for younger people to aspire to and to connect with rather than creating a divide of I just don't get this generation and I'm this generation. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, you know, think happens. they're an era that that's an era in dogs. Those, those yeah those very powerful, recognizable forces of nature that sort of, no question, they all have, um, they've all impacted every one of us in one shape, way or another, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Is there anybody else who sticks out to you as particularly impactful? You know, I think um, there are so many that, you know, the third grouping is sort of a collective um, breeder exhibitor person because um, yeah. we learn so much from everyone, you know, um, all of these people. I mean, David Fitzpatrick, Jerry Martyr, you know, people that I always have, um, I've been fortunate enough to be friends with, but they also impact yeah. your life by watching them um, in their own craft of their own breed, you know, to emulate their ability uh, to continue to be successful, um, conscientious of breed integrity, but also, you know, forging your, you know, path forward to improve the dogs that you're breeding. And, and so I think my third, my third one is that collective breeder source that um, we all have worked um, to, you know, together to be better. What a great answer, because there are certainly those individuals that are kind of in their specific class of, of decades of a breeding program that they've both bred, but also shown and exhibited at those high levels and kind of done it all, so to speak. Sure. I mean, those, those are the, the pinnacle, you know, you, you see these people who have invested their entire life and you have to admire and respect that. Um, and and it's, it's good for all of us to kind of just watch them in their own element to, to do their thing and, and do it so well. Yeah, and we've touched on this, but in kind of conclusion, what would be some of the main qualities that as you reflect on these experiences in your life, that you try to just be mindful of and emulate as you're coming in contact with younger people and you're talking about looking for who's gonna carry over the next generations into your breeding program and just in the sport in general. I think um, this next phase of imparting knowledge to someone is really focusing on being inclusive, being open, mm -hmm. being honest, um, showing value in the new person's perspective um, so that you can kind of retain their interest so that they, you know, that it's not a fly by night type situation, you know. So you want to encourage people to come to the table. And um, all of us, I think we maybe suffer from some um, distance rather than being inclusive. Uh, so I think yeah. that's first. Um, the other thing is we we all have to recognize where our sport is today. And so the the act of breeding has been under some sort of an assault publicly sure. to um, you know have the anti-breeder. Um, so we should take that mantra and be proud to have bred quality dogs and move that forward and remind people that what we do have has a lot of value and purpose and that yeah. we many of us um, are dealing with breeds and the, the longer we stay at the sport the more breeds fall into that lesser known um, you know rarer breed and so these breeds are somewhat endangered and so it's important to find people to breed them to and so everybody that comes through your door is somebody you don't know who's going to be the next one you know who's who's going to take on the mantra Sure. They're so not going to walk in there saying they know that that's what they want to do and that's where they want to go. Sometimes it has to be like the 15-year-old dog that 
right. you see the potential. <laughs> you know, you just never know. You just really never know. And and things change. I mean, you you don't like the same things at 15 that you like at 30. It, it is what it is. It's, it's evolving. Sure. It's growing. Um, but I think that it's important to instill in people a sense of uh, responsibility to continue to breed and to continue to exhibit um, a lot of these very, very rare, very lesser known animals that um, without those people will go away, unfortunately. Such a great point, such a great point. Well, Doug, thank you so much for your time and sharing about the experiences that shaped you. It's always a pleasure hearing about your story and dogs. Well, I appreciate it, thanks. Great to see you. As always. Thank <laughs> you.